Hello, all you beautiful people. I am the suave librarian. Nah, just kidding with you. <laughs> I guess my name is Romance Freak, and welcome back to reading Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that little joke because when I was when I got to wearing this, I kind of looked like a librarian of some sort. You know, those stereotypical librarians always wear shawls. But anyway, joke aside, bad joke aside, moving on. We're going to be on last where we left off in. Chapter 8, we have just met all our teachers, including the Potion Master, who hates Harry, and now we are on to Chapter 9, The Midnight Duel, where Draco is going to challenge Harry. Uh -uh, no, you did not. Uh -uh, nobody challenged the chosen one. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's just sit back, relax, and enjoy the book with me, and I hope I can keep you company for today. <laughs> chapter 9, The Midnight Duel. Harry never believed he would meet a boy he hated more than Dudley, but that was before he met Draco Malfoy. Still, first-year Gryffindors only had potions with Slytherin, so they didn't have to put up with Malfoy much. Or at least, they didn't until they spotted a notice pinned up in the Gryffindor common room that made them all groan. Flying lessons would be starting on Thursday, and Gryffindor and Slytherin would be learning together. Come on now, nothing wrong with Slytherins. I'm, I'm a be Slytherin. Um, typical, said Harry darkly. Just what I always wanted, to make a fool of myself on a broomstick in front of Malfoy. He had been looking forward to learning to fly more than anything else. You don't know if you make a fool of yourself, said Ron recently. Anyway, I know Malfoy is always going on about how good he is at Quidditch, but I bet that's all talk. Malfoy certainly did talk about flying a lot. He complained loudly about first years never getting on the house Quidditch teams and told long, boastful stories that always seemed to end with him narrowly escaping the muggles on helicopters. He wasn't the only one, though. The way Seamus Finnegan told it, he spent most of his childhood zooming around the countryside on his broomstick. Even Ron wouldn't would tell anyone who listened about the time he'd almost hit a hanging glider on Charlie's old broom. Everyone from wizarding families talked about Quidditch constantly. Ron had already had a big argument with Dean Thomas, who shared their dormitory about soccer. Ron couldn't see what was exciting about a game with only one football where no one was allowed to fly. Harry had caught Ron prodding Dean Thomas posters of West Ham soccer team, trying to make the players move. <laughs> Neville had never been on broomstick in his life, because his grandmother had led even near one. Privately, Harry felt she had a good reason, because Neville managed to have an extraordinary number of accidents, even with both feet on the ground. Hermione Granger was almost as nervous about flying as Neville was. This was something you couldn't learn by heart about out a book, not that she hadn't tried. At breakfast on Thursday, she bored them all with stupid flying tips she'd gotten out of a library book called Quidditch Through the Ages. I've got the book. It's a good read. Neville was hanging on to her every word, desperate for anything that might help him hang on to his broomstick later. But everybody else was very pleased which, when Hermione's lecture was interrupted by the arrival of the mail. Harry had a single letter once since Hagrid's note, something that Malfoy had been quick to notice, of course. Malfoy's eagle owl was always bringing him packages of sweets from home, which he opened gloatingly at the Slytherin table. A barn owl brought Neville a small package from his grandmother. He opened it excitedly and showed them all a gra glass ball the size of a large marble, which seemed to be full of white smoke. It's a memorable, he explained. Grand knows I always forget things. This tells you if there's something you've forgotten to do. Look, you hold it tight like this, and if it turns red... Oh. His face fell because the memorable had suddenly glowed scarlet. You've forgotten something. Neville was trying to remember what he'd forgotten when Draco Malfoy, who was passing the Gryffindor table, snatched the memorable from his hand. Harry and Ron jumped to their feet. They were half hoping for a reason to fight Malfoy, but Professor Nergongle, who could spot trouble quicker than any teacher in the school, was there in a flash. What's going on? Malfoy's got my remember all, Professor. Scowling, Malfoy quickly dropped the remember all back on the table. Just looking, said he said, and he sloped away with a crab and Goyle behind them. At 3.30 that afternoon, Harry, Ron, and the other Gryffindors hurried down the front steps onto the grounds for the first flying lesson. It was a clear, breezy day, and the glass rippled under their feet as they marched down the sloping lawns toward a smooth, flat lawn on the opposite side of the grounds to the forbidden forest, whose trees were swaying darkly in the distance. The Slytherins were already there, and so were twenty broomsticks lying in neat lines on the ground. 
Harriet heard Fred and George Weasley complain about the school broom, saying that some of them started to vibrate if you flew too high or always flew slightly to the left. Their teacher, Madame Hooch, arrived. She had short, gray hair and yellow eyes like a hawk. Well, what are you waiting for? She barked. Everyone stand by a broomstick. Come on, hurry up. Harry glanced down at his broom. It was old, and some of the twigs stuck out odd angles. Stick your right hand to the broom, called Madame Hooch, out of the front, and say up. Up, everyone shouted. Harry's broom jumped into his hand at once, but it was one of the few that did. Hermione Granger's had simply rolled over on the ground, and Neville's hadn't moved at all. Perhaps brooms, like horses, could tell when you're afraid, thought Harry. There was a quaver in Neville's voice that said only too clearly that he wanted to keep his feet on the ground. Madame Hooch then showed them how to d mount their brooms without sliding off the end, and walked up and down the rows of correcting their grips. Harry and Ron were delighted when she told Malfoy that he'd been doing it wrong for years. Now, when I blow my whistle, you kick from the ground hard, said Madame Hooch. Keep your bones steady, rise a few feet, then come straight back down, and by loving, leaning forward slightly. On my whistle, three, two. But Neville, nervous and jumpy and frightened, being left off the ground, pushed off hard before the whistle had touched Madame Hoop's lips. Come back, boy, she shouted, but Neville was rising straight up like a cork shot of a bottle. Twelve feet, twenty feet. Harry saw his scared white face look down at the ground, falling away, saw him gasp, slip sideways off the broom, and wham, a thud and nasty crack, and Neville lay face down on the grass in a heap. His broom was still rising higher and higher, and started to drift lazily toward the forbidden forest and out of sight. Madame Hooch was bending over Neville, her face white as his. Oh, broken wrist. Harry heard her mutter, Come on, boy. It's all right. I'll be yet. She turned to the rest of the class. Now, none of you is to move while I take this boy to the hospital wing. You leave those brims where they are, or you'll be out of Hogwarts before you can say Quidditch. Come on, dear. Neville, his, fe his face tear-streaked, clutched his wrist, hobbled off with Madame Hooch, who had her arm around him. Poor Neville. He's such a sweet guy. And... I hate it when so much bad stuff happened to him. He's just got bad luck. No sooner they were out of earshot than Malfoy burst into laughter. Did you see his face, the great lump? The other Slytherins joined in. Shut up, Malfoy! snapped Pravati Patil. Ooh, sticking up for Longbottom, said Pansy Parkinson, a hard-faced Slytherin girl. Never thought you like a fat little crying baby's Pravati. Look, said Malfoy, darting forward and snatching something over the grass. It's that stupid thing Longbottom's ground sent him. The remember all glittered in the sun as he held it up. Give that to him, Malfoy, said Harry quietly. Everyone stopped talking to watch. Malfoy smiled nastily. No, I think I'll leave it somewhere for Longbottom to find. How about it up in a tree? Give it here, Harry yelled, but Malfoy had leapt onto his broomstick and taken off. He hadn't been lying. He could fly well. Hovering level with the topmost branches of an oak, he called, Come and get it, Potter! Harry grabbed his broom. No! shouted Hermione Granger. Madame Hooch told us not to move. You'll get us all into trouble. Harry ignored her. Blood was pounding in his ears. He mounted the broom and kicked hard against the ground, and up, up he soared. Air rushed through his hair, and his robes whipped out behind him. And in a rush of fierce joy, he realized he found something he could do without being taught. This was easy. This was wonderful. He pulled his broomstick up a little to take it even higher, and her gas and screams of girls back on the ground and admiring whoop from Ron. He turned his broomstick sharply to face Malfoy midair. Malfoy looked stunned. Get it here, Harry called, or I'll knock you off your broom. Oh yeah? said Malfoy, trying to sneer but looking worried. Harry knew somehow what to do. He leaned forward and grasped the broom tightly in both hands and shot toward Malfoy like a javelin. Malfoy only just got away in time. Harry made a sharp about face and held the broom steady. A few people below were clapping. No cabagoyle up here to save your neck, Malfoy, Harry called. The thought, same thought seemed to have struck Malfoy. Catch it if you can, then, he shouted. He threw the glass ball high in the air and streaked back toward the ground. Harry saw it as though in slow motion the ball rise up in the air and then start to fall. He leaned forward and pointed his drum handle down, and next second he was gathering speed in a steep dive, racing the ball. Wind whistled in his ears, mingled with the straight screams of people watching, he stretched out his hand. A foot from the ground he caught it, just in time to pull his broom straight, and he toppled gently onto the grass to remember all, clutched safely in his fist. Harry Potter! 
Harry's heart sank faster than he had just dived. Professor McGonagall was running toward them. He got to his feet, trembling. Never in all my time of Hogwarts! Professor McGonagall was almost speechless with shock, and her glasses flashed furiously. How dare you! Might have broken your neck! It wasn't his fault, Professor! Be quiet, Miss Patil. But Malfoy! That's enough, Mr. Weasley. Potter, follow me now. Harry caught sight of Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle's triumphant faces as he left, walking numbly in Professor McGonagall's wake as she strode up toward the castle. He was going to be expelled. He just knew it. He wanted to say something to defend himself, but there seemed to be something wrong with his voice. Professor McGonagall was sweeping along even without looking at him. He had a jog to keep up. Now he'd done it. He hadn't even lasted two weeks. He'd pack in his bags in ten minutes. What would the Dursleys say when he turned up on his doorstep? Up the front steps, of the marble st staircase inside, and still Professor McGonagall didn't say a word to him. She wrenched open the door and marched along corridors with Harry trotting miserably behind her. Maybe she was taken to Dumbledore. He thought of Hagrid, expelled but allowed to stay on as gamekeeper. Perhaps he could be Hagrid's assistant. His stomach twisted as he imagined, watching Ron and the others becoming wizards while he stumped around the grounds carrying Hagrid's bag. Professor McGonagall stopped outside a classroom. She opened the door and poked her head inside. Excuse me, Professor Flitwick, could I borrow wood for a moment? Wood? thought Harry, bewildered. Was wood a cane he was going to use? she was going to use on him? But Wood turned out to be a person, a burly fifth-year boy who came out of Flitwick's class looking confused. Follow me, you two, said Professor McGonagall, and they marched up a corridor, look Wood looking curiously at Harry. In here. Professor McGonagall pointed them into a classroom that was empty except for Peeves, who was busy writing rude words on the blackboard. Out, Peeves, she barked. And Peeves threw the chalk into a bin, which clanged loudly, and, she, and he swooped out, cursing. Professor McGonagall slammed the door behind him and turned to face the two boys. Potter, this is Oliver Wood. Wood, I found you a new seeker. Wood's expression changed from puzzlement to delight. Are you serious, Professor? Absolutely, said Professor McGonagall crisply. The boy's a natural. I've never seen anything like it. Was this your first time on broomstick, Potter? Harry nodded silently. He had no clue what was going on, but he didn't seem to be expelled and felt some feelings started to come back into his legs. He caught the thing in his hand about a fifty foot dive, Professor McGonagall told Wood. Didn't even scratch himself. Charlie Weasley couldn't have done it. Wood was now looking as though all his dreams had come true at once. Ever seen a game of Quidditch, Potter? he asked excitedly. Wood's captain of the Gryffindor Quidditch team, Professor McGonagall explained. He's just the bill for Sika, too, said Wood, now walking around Harry and staring at him. Light, speedy, we'll have to get him a decent broom, Professor. And never stood out in our claim of sweeps, heading, I'll say. I'll speak to Professor Dumbledore, see if we can bend the, the first year pool. Heaven knows, we need a better team than last year. Flattened by the match of Slytherin, I couldn't look Severus Slave in the face for weeks. Professor McGonagall peered sternly over glass at Harry. I want you to hear your training hard, Potter. Or I may change my mind about punishing you. Then she suddenly smiled. Your father would have been proud, she said. He was an excellent Quidditch player himself. You're joking! It was dinner time, and Harry was just finished telling Ron what had happened when he left the grounds with Professor McGonagall. Ron had a piece of steak and kitty pie halfway to his mouth, but he'd forgotten all about it. Seeker? He said, but first he is never. He must be the youngest house player in about a century, said Harry, shoveling pie into his mouth. He felt particularly hungry after the excitement of the afternoon. Wood told me. Ron was so amazed, so impressed, he just sat and gaped at Harry. I s start training next week, said Harry. Only don't tell anyone. Wood wants to keep it a secret. Fred and George Weasley now came to the hall, spotted Harry, and hurried over. Well done, said George in low voice. Wood told us we're on the team, too. The base says, I'll tell you, we're going to win Quidditch Cup for sure this year, said Fred. We haven't won since Charlie left. But this year's team is going to be brilliant. You must be good, Harry. Wood's almost skipping when he told us. Anyway, we've got to go. The Jordan's records he found a new secret passageway out of the school. But it's that one behind the statue of Gregory, the smarmy, that I found in the first week. Say you. Fred and George had hardly disappeared when someone far less welcome turned up. Malfoy, flanked by Crabbe and Goyle. Having a last meal, Potter? When are you going to get back on the train to the Muggles? You got, you're a lot braver now that you got your back on the ground and you've got your little friends with you, said Harry coolly. There was, of course, nothing little about Crabbe and Goyle, but as the high table was full of teachers, neither of them could do more than crack their knuckles and scowl. 
I take you any time on my own, said Malfoy. Tonight, if you want. Wizard's duel. Wands only. No contact. What's the matter? Never heard of a wizard's duel before, I suppose? Of course he has, said Ron, wheeling around. I'm a second. Who's yours? Malfoy looked at Crab and Goyle, seizing them up. Um, Crab, he said. Midnight, all right. We'll meet you in the trophy room. That's always unlocked. When Malfoy had gone, Ron and Harry looked at each other. What is a wizard's duel? said Harry. What do you mean you're my second? Well, the second's there to take, you, take over if you die, said Ron casually, getting started at last on his cold pie. Catching the look at Harry's face, he added quickly, uh, but people only die in proper duels, you know, with real wizards. The most of you and Malfoy will do is send sparks at each other. Neither of you know enough magic to do any real damage. I bet he suspected you to refuse anyway. And what if I wave my wand and nothing happens? Throw it away, punch him in the nose, said Ron suggested. Excuse me? And they both looked up. It was Spiny Granger. Can't a person aid in pace in this place, said Ron. Hermione ignored him and spoke to Harry. I couldn't help overhearing what you and Malfoy were saying. But you could, Ron muttered. And you mustn't go wandering on school at night. Think of those points you'll lose Gryffindor if you're caught. And you're bound to be. It's very selfish of you. And it's really none of your business, said Harry. Goodbye, said Ron. Uh, I need a quick drink. Apologies. Ah, uh, water's always good for the soul. <clears throat> All the same, it wasn't what you call the perfect end to the day, Harry thought, as he lay awake much later listening to Dean and Seamus falling asleep. Neville wasn't back from the hospital wing. Ron had spent all evening giving him as much advice, advice such as, if he tries to curse you, you better dodge it, because I can't remember how to block them. There was a very good chance they were going to get caught by Filch or Mrs. Norris, and Harry felt he was being pushing his luck, breaking out of school world today. On the other hand, Malfoy's sneering face kept moving out of the darkness. This was a big chance to beat Malfoy face to face. He couldn't miss it. Half past eleven, Ron muttered at last, better go. They pulled on their bathrobes, picked up their wands, and crept across the tower room, down the spiral staircase, and into the Gryffindor common room. A few embers were still glowing in the fireplace, and turning all the armchairs into hunched black shadows, they had almost searched, reached the portrait hole, when a voice spoke from the terrace near them. I can't believe you're going to do this, Harry! A lamp flickered on. It was Hermione Granger wearing a pink bathrobe and a frown. You, said Ron, go back to bed. I almost told your brother, Hermione said, Percy, he's a prefect. He put a stop to this. Harry couldn't believe anyone could be so interfering. Come on, he said to Ron. He pushed open the portrait of the fat lady and climbed through the hole. Hermione wasn't going to give up that easily. She followed Ron through the portrait hole, hissing at them like an angry goose. Don't you care about Gryffindor? Don't you only care about yourselves? I don't want Slytherin to win the house cup, and you'll lose all the points I got from Professor McGonagall for knowing about switching spells. Go away. All right, but I warned you. Do, you just remember what I said when you're on the train home tomorrow. You're so... But what they were, they didn't find out. Marnie had turned to the portrait of the fat lady to get back inside, and found herself facing an empty painting. The fat lady had gone for a nighttime visit, and Marnie was locked out of the Gryffindor Tower. Now what am I going to do? She asked shrilly. That's your problem, said Ron. We've got to go. We're going to be late. They haven't reached the end of the corridor when Hermione caught up with them. I'm coming with you. You are not. Do you think I'm going to stand out here and wait for Filch to catch me? If I'm all three of us, I'll tell him the truth. That I was trying to stop you and you can back me up. You've got some nerve, Ron said loudly. Shut up, both of you. Sorry, said sharply. I heard something. It was sort of snuffling. Mrs. Norris? Breathed Ron, squinting through the dark. It wasn't Mrs. Norris. It was Neville. He was curled up on the floor, fast asleep, but jerked suddenly awake as they crept nearer. Thank goodness you found me! I've been out here for hours. I couldn't remember the new password to get in bed. Keep your voice down, Neville. The password's pig snout, but it won't do you help you now. The has gone off somewhere. How's your arm? said Harry. Fine, said Neville, showing them. Madame Pomfrey mended it about a minute. Good. Well, Neville, look. We've got to be somewhere. We'll see you later. Don't leave me, said Neville, scrambling to his feet. I don't want to stay here alone. The bloody Baron's been passed twice already. Ron looked at his watch and glared furiously at Hermione and Neville. If either of you get us caught, I'll never rest until I've learned the curse of the bogies Quill tells about and use it on you. Hermione opened her mouth, perhaps to tell Ron exactly how to use the curse of the bogies. 
but Harry hissed her to be quiet and beckoned them all forward. I flit along the corridor, stripped, striped with bars of moonlight um, from the high windows. At every turn, Harry expected to run into Filch or Mrs. Norris, but they were lucky. They sped up a spare staircase to the third floor and tiptoed toward the trophy room. Malfoy and Crabbe weren't there yet. The crystal trophy cases glimmered when the moonlight caught them. Cups, shields, plates, and statues winked silver and gold in the darkness. They edged along the walls, keeping their eyes on the doors at either end of the room. Harry looked out his, took out his wand in case Malfoy leapt in and started at once. The minutes crept by. He's late. Maybe he's chickened out, Ron whispered. There was a noise in the next room that made him jump. Harry had only just raised his wand when he heard someone speak. And it wasn't Malfoy. Sniff around, my sweet. They might be lurking in a corridor. It was Filch speaking to Mrs. Mor Norris. Horror struck. They waved. Harry waved madly to the other three to follow him as quickly as possible. They scurried silently toward the door, away from Filch's voice. Neville's robes had barely whipped around the corridor corner when they heard Filch enter the trophy room. They're in here somewhere. They heard him mutter. Probably hiding. This way, Harry mouthed to the others, and petrified, they began to creep down a long gallery full of suits of armor. They could hear Filch getting nearer. Neville suddenly let out a frightened squeak and broke into a run. He tripped, grabbed Ron around their waist, and the pair of them toppled right into a suit of armor. The clanging and crashing were enough to wake the whole castle. Ron! Harry yelled, and the four of them sprinted down the gallery, not looking back to see whether Filch was following. They swung around the doorpost and galloped down one corridor, then another. Harry in the lead, without any idea where they were, or how, where they were going. They ripped through the tapestry and found themselves in a hidden passageway, hurled along it, and came out near their charms, charms classroom, which they knew was miles from the trophy room. <sighs> I think we lost him. Harry panted. Leaning against the cold wall and wiping his forehead, Neville was bent double, wheezing and spluttering. I told you, Hermione gasped, clutching the stitch in her chest. I told you. We've got to get back to Gryffindor Tower, said Ron, quickly as possible. Malfoy tricked you, Hermione said to Harry. You realize that, don't you? He was never going to meet you. Filch knew someone was going to be in the trophy room. Malfoy must have tripped him off. Harry thought she was probably right, but he wasn't going to tell her that. Let's go. It wasn't going to be that simple. They hadn't gone more than a dozen paces when a doorknob rattled and something came shooting out of the classroom in front of them. It was Peeves. He caught sight of them and gave a squeal of delight. Shut up, play Peeves, please. You'll get us thrown out. Peeves cackled. Wanding around... At midnight, ickle firsties. Tut, tut, tut. Naughty, naughty, you'll get caughty. Now, if you don't give us away, Peeves, please. Should tell Filch, I sh Filch, I should, said Peeves in a saintly voice, but his eyes glittered wickedly. It's for your own good, you know. Get out of the way, snapped Ron, taking a swipe at Peeves. This was a big mistake. Students out of bed! Peeves bellowed, students out of bed, down the charms corridor! Ducking under Peeves, they ran for their lives right into the end of the corridor, which they slammed into a door. It was locked. This is it, Ron moaned. As they pushed helplessly against the door, we're done for. This is the end. They couldn't help. They could hear footsteps and Filch running as fast as he could towards Peeves' shouts. Oh, move over! Hermione snarled. She grabbed Harry's wand, tapped the lock, and whispered, "Hello, Hamara." The lock clicked, and the door swung open. They piled through the it, shut, shut it quickly, pressed their ears against it, listening. Which way did they... <clears throat> Which way did they go, Peeves? Phils was saying. Quick, tell me. Say, please. Don't mess with me, Peeves. Now, where did they go? Shall not say nothing if you don't say please, said Peeves in an annoying sing-song voice. All right. Please. Nothing! <laughs> and told you would say nothing if you didn't say please. <laughs> they heard the sound of Peeves whooshing away and Filch cursing in rage. He thinks the door is locked, Harry whispered. I think we'll be okay. Get off, Neville! For Neville had been tugging on the sleeve of Harry's bathrobe for the last minute. What? 
Harry turned around and saw quite clearly what. For a moment, he was sure that he walked into a nightmare. This was too much, on top of everything that had happened so far. They weren't in a room, he had supposed. They were in a corridor, the Forbidden Corridor, on the third floor. And now they knew why it was forbidden. They were looking straight into the eyes of a monstrous dog, a dog that filled the whole space between ceiling and floor. It had three heads, three pairs of rolling mad eyes, three noses twitching and quivering in their direction, three drooling mouths, saliva hanging in their slippery robes from yellowish fangs. It was standing quite still, all six eyes staring at them, and Harry knew the only reason they weren't already dead was that the sudden appearance was taken by surprise, but it was quickly getting over that. There was no mistaking those what those thunderous growls meant. Harry groped for the doorknob. Between Filch and death, he'd take Filch. They fell backward. Harry slammed the door shut, and they almost they ran. They almost flew back down the corridor. Filch must have hurried off to look for them somewhere else because they didn't see him anywhere. But they hardly cared. All they wanted to do was put as much space as possible between them and that monster. I don't blame them. They didn't stop running until they reached the portrait of the fat lady on the seventh floor. <sighs> Where on earth have you all been? she asked, looking at their bathrobes hanging off their shoulders, their flushed, sweaty faces. N never mind that. Pig snout, pig snout, Harry, panted Harry, and the portrait swung forward. They scrambled into the common room, collapsed, trembling into armchairs. It was a while before any of them said anything. Neville, indeed, looked as he'd never speak again. What would they think they're doing? Keeping a thing like that lock on his skull? said Ron finally. If any dog needs exercise, that one does. Hermione got her breath and her bad temper back again. You don't you, you don't use your eyes, any of you, do you? She snapped. Did you see what it was standing on? The floor? Harry whispered. It wasn't looking at its feet. I was too busy with its heads. No, not the floor. It was standing on a trap door. It's obviously guarding something. She stood up, glaring at them. I hope you're pleased with yourselves. We all could have been killed, or worse, expelled. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed. Ron stared after her, his mouth open. No, we don't mind, he said. You think we'd dragged her along, would you? You think we'd dragged her along, wouldn't you? <clears throat> but Hermione had given Harry something else to think about as he climbed back to bed. The dog was guarding something. What had Hagrid said? Gringotts was the safest place in the world for something he wanted to hide. Except perhaps Hogwarts. It looked as though Harry had found... Where the grubby little package from Vault 713 was. Dun, dun, dun! And with that, well, um, we are going to be starting Chapter 10 next week. So, and that was an awesome chapter. Like, I love it. Uh, this is, it's really good. I love it that so much has happened that both good and bad. Like, good because Harry joined the, quit the team now, and second, that the, the, the bad because like they've um you know they ran into the um the three headed dog um but like not not that any want anything bad really to happen to him but <laughs> but anyways point is that it was a really good chapter full it's full of like adventure in this one so anyways so now for the question of the week um question of the week is So let me know what kind of adventure you had, either A, with your with your team when you first joined up, or B, um, being sneaking around and that kind of thing, um, and with your friends and like, getting caught or like getting away with it. Let me know Let me know what your adventures and down in the comment section below, and I shall be reading them in a, in a future video. So, peace out. Love y'all. See you next time in my den. Arr!